So welcome to the first episode of Agent Provocateur with the one and only Alan Walsh. And I think before we get into this episode with David Perron, Alan, one of your your good buddies from a, for a long, long time, I think it's important um, that we discuss where we're going with this because a lot of people are going to be like, okay, Alan Walsh has a podcast. Why? And and what what are you going to tell people? What do you see and envision for this show? Well, uh, that's a great question. It's something that I've been uh, thinking about doing for a long time. Uh, you and I connected over the summer and had uh, numerous conversations about uh, doing a podcast together and some of the issues we want to talk about. Uh, and I think there's a general theme to to everything that we're going to do together uh, this year. You know, one of the goals of this podcast uh, is to peel back the curtain and and take the audience behind the scenes. Over my 26 years representing players, I've accumulated so many amazing, fascinating stories. And over the years, I've taken to start writing them down so I don't forget them. Because when you get to my, my vintage, you start to forget things uh, that <laughs> happened. So I've, I've got a uh, running list of uh, stories, events, things that happened. And scrolling through them periodically... Uh, They make me smile. They make me laugh. And they also, you say, wow, if people only knew this actually happened behind the scenes. And that's really what this podcast is going to be all about. And and by bringing on uh, different guests uh, that participated in some of these stories who have knowledge about some of the things that happened, I think we can really together bring it to life. And, and, and everyone who has any familiarity with who I am knows that I'm passionate about certain issues, uh, especially regarding concussions and CTE, Um, you know, talking about those issues, even though Gary Bettman denies that uh, CTE even exists or there's any link between traumatic brain injury and CTE. We all know there is. And, mm-hmm. and it has a, a deep, deep impact on NHL players, not just during their careers, but post-career. And it's something that I've always been extremely passionate about. And I'm hoping that in discussing and bringing to light some of these stories, that the people who are, are, are listening, our audience is going to have a, a similar passion for, for some of these issues. I think that um, over the years, I've always been very passionate about um, collective bargaining and the the history of collective bargaining in the NHL. And many people today don't really understand or have knowledge about how the NHLPA got to be where they are today. And to put it all into perspective, they need to know some of the seminal seminal moments that occurred. Bob Goodenow. uh, taking the executive director role of the NHLPA in 1991, uh, the fact that NHL players went on strike in 1992, 10 days before the start of the Stanley Cup playoffs, and winning the right to their name, image, and likeness, which was one of the most important seminal moments in player history. Uh, The 1994-95 lockout, which lasted half a season, Uh, jump forward 10 years, the 2004-2005 lost season, Uh, then jump forward again to 2012-13 and the half season lockout. These are critical, critical events that occurred that impact every single NHL player today. And I think uh, through what we're doing together, we're going to bring a lot of that to life. It's, it, you know what, Alan, it's the, the thing is, it's not just the mechanics of, of, of collective bargaining or of CTE or of, uh, the other topics that you're passionate about. These are stories, right? And that's the best part about podcasting is the storytelling that you have. And we're going to get perspectives uh, just from the list of guests that we have lined up and from the insights that, you know, Alan and I have spoken about. Um, uh, we're going to stories that you have never ever heard before and it'll help you understand the game from a level we've just never seen right we always get the player perspective 
we always get the GM perspective, the owner perspective, the president perspective. When have we ever got the agent perspective? And when, uh, you know, and, and frankly, agents are, and excuse the terminology here, Alan, but they are kind of the grease that keeps the engine going. And so I think what you're going to get out of this show to what Alan said is, is just stories and information that you have never heard before. It's going to blow your mind. Alan and I have already had discussions at length that have absolutely taken my head off and completely changed my understanding of the game that, you know, I grew up watching and thought I knew so much about, I know nothing. And that's what's so exciting about this. So Alan, really excited to do this show with you. And, you know, I think this first guess is perfect because Dave Perron is a guy that a lot of people will know as an NHL player, but they don't know him as a person necessarily. And they don't know the story of how he went from house league to the NHL in about four years. Uh, and that is the story we're going to tell next. So, um, I mean, unless there's something else that we you would like to get to before that, should we bring David on? Absolutely. Let's go. Welcome to the inaugural, the very first Agent Provocateur with Alan Walsh podcast. I'm going to, I'm going to clap. I'm going to clap. This is a long time uh, in the making. And, uh, you know, obviously, Alan, I want to bring you on. And I want to bring on one of your uh, your star pupils, I guess. Is that is that a fair way to call it? Star clients, David Perron. David, thank you for making time for us today. Um, Alan, I, I just, before we get to you, David, I, Alan, I just want to ask, how are you feeling about this? A little bit of nerves or? No, I'm excited. This is going to be a lot of fun. I think so too. I think so too. So David, uh, David, how are you feeling about this? How, first off, do you think Alan's cut out for the podcast world? I think he's ready to go. I think he's. Uh, I talked to him about it. He's very excited. So I'm. I'm obviously honored to be the first guest, and uh, let's see where it goes after this. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I kind of, um, Alan. I, I when I talked to Alan off off uh, off air about this, one of the things he said, and he said this to me and and producer Jesse, was you know that that we had to hear this story. And that the story had been told in bits and pieces about David Perron, but that it had never been told in like a succinct manner, like what we're about to do. And it's going to be one of those stories, I think, that you hear today that is the story that you almost want to write down in a book, make a movie about, and that you sort of, and, and I'll say this on my behalf, because I always wanted to play in the NHL and I never got out of house league, um, you, you would want to happen to you. So, so Alan, where do we start in the David Perron story, and and how did you guys get introduced? That's my first question. Well, there's so many great stories that David has accumulated over the course of his career, but there's one story that is just incredible, and it's the story of David's first NHL training camp with the St. Louis Blues. Okay, so to give you a little background, David and I first met when he was playing in the Quebec Major Junior League when he was 19. But you have to appreciate the progression that took place here. David went from house league to junior triple A with St. Jerome to the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League uh, a year after his first NHL draft eligibility where he got drafted in the first round of the NHL draft to as a 19 year old playing with the St. Louis blues in the NHL. And the story really begins uh, when David is supposed to be invited to his first NHL training camp after being a first round pick. And then one day I get a phone call from Larry Plo, the GM of St. Louis at the time. And he says, hey, Alan, uh, David is playing, and, and we knew he was playing, in the uh, Canada-Russia Super Series, which was the 35th anniversary of the 1972 Summit Series between Canada and the Soviet Union. And they were playing four games in Russia and then four games across Canada in different locations to commemorate the series. Now, because David was part of this team to play for Canada, he was going to miss all of rookie camp. All right. 
So the Blues at the time were playing in a tournament in Traverse City with about 12, 13 other NHL teams. He's going to miss all of rookie camp, and he was going to miss the first couple of days of the big camp. So Larry says to me, you know what, Alan, we're at 62 players. Uh, We're full. Uh, Coach is going to want to get down to his team real quick. What we're going to do is when the Super Series is over, we're just going to send David right back to his junior team. And, And I said, I said, Larry, you can't do that. You just can't do that. He's your first round pick. You have to invite him to your camp 24 hours, 48 hours. You have to let him show up, see everything, see everybody, step on the ice with the NHL players. You have to let him do that. And Larry ended up saying, well, I'm going to think about it and uh, I'll call you back in a couple of days. So Larry calls me back in a couple of days and he says, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to bring David in for 48 hours. All right. And then we're sending him back to junior. You made a lot of good points, but he's only going to be here for 48 hours. We got a preseason game coming up and, and it's going to be important. We're going to be sending all the junior guys back. We're going to be sending guys to the American league. And, and, and that's the way it's going to be. And I said, fine. Now I'm, I'm not telling David, He's only going to be there for 48 hours. Right, Dave? I, ne- I never heard about any of that, to be honest, until uh, l- later on in, in December. We're having dinner uh, real quickly before Alan keeps going with the story, I guess. But uh, we're having dinner at some point in December in, in L.A. And he's like, I got to tell you this. I, I can't keep it. Uh, I got to get this off my chest. Uh, it's, been, it's been a long time now. You're a full NA- full-time NHL player. Because I had played over nine games at the time. And uh, he's like, just so you know, you were really never invited to camp. I kind of had to get you in for a couple of days and on and on and on. So I, I, I really don't know all the details. I don't remember all the details if you want to keep going with the story. But I guess it, it follows up with after two days, they called Alan and they said, I guess we'll keep him around for a couple more days, give him an NHL game and go from there and uh, go, go ahead, Alan. Yeah, but, we'll hear, but, but here's what happened. There's something really important intervening. So, so David gets finishes the uh, uh, games with uh, in the Canada-Russia Super Series. He gets to St. Louis, and you're on the ice one of your two days in St. Louis, and something happened with Keith Kachuk. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. so you want to want to tell everybody one. that? Yeah, I, I, I can, I guess now. And I, I've said it before, but it's, it's always been the. So I, I think that's what kind of opened up the door for me. Obviously, uh, a junior guy comes in normally, they want him playing games. Uh, a lot of times the, the, the young guy is not ready to make an impact. He's kind of tiptoeing around. And I never had that about me. I always wanted to come in, make an impact, show I'm confident. Um, with and without the puck, I guess. So we do this like drill in the corner. It's a two on two. Uh, there's the nets are closed kind of like at each side of the, the circle, basically. So it's a very tight area. I'm in the corner battling Keith Kachuk. I'm like pushing him on his back, kind of like a little cross check. He fall, he falls on his face. I grab the puck. I did kill our number one goalie at the time, Manny legacy kind of back in. I put it top shelf. <laughs> I'm pretty happy about myself. I turn around and this big, big guy's chasing me down the ice. So now I'm skating at the opposite side of the ice where no no more player are because Keith Kachuk obviously is probably the superstar of the team at the time. And I'm not real, realizing that at, at my age, I'm just kind of naive about this, that you don't really do that to the star on the team. But I had to make a name for myself, and that's kind of how it started. I, I got to jump in. I got to ask this because, you know, David, the first thing that comes to mind when 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 Alan mentions that you're going to be at the Super Series is, you know, you're a 19-year-old kid. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, guys, David, you went undrafted the first time you were eligible, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So already, you know, I mean, you had to manage that, move past that. It obviously sounds like, um, you know, you're you're somebody that is able to just kind of bowl through things if you're jumping from house league to, to junior AAA to almost the NHL. But when we're talking about um, showing up at camp, did it did it cross your mind ever? 
that you being at that super series may be an issue at NHL camp that you were missing rookie camp. Did it ever occur to you that that might work against you? No, I, I was just excited, obviously, to play for uh, Hockey Canada, really. Yeah. I never thought about it. Um, I was always good. Just to answer your question, I was always good. I never played hockey to to make a league or to play junior or to do it, play in the NHL. I played hockey because I loved it. And I, can't, I think that's kind of what helped me get to a level and not be impressed by those guys. I just was trying to make an impact. So many things happened in my life that kind of gave me that type of character. Um, so I, I guess I made the best of it. And I guess one more detail on that story. So now I'm thinking Keith Kachuk wants to kill me, wants me <laughs> off. The, uh, probably he's going to cut me himself. He, he's going to go right up to the manager and say, this, this kid's done. So I guess he did the opposite. I, he went to a coach later on. He's like, that's what we need. Or someone, some of those guys did. We need guys that come in, want to make an impact, want to make a difference. And the, I guess the, my first, um, exhibition game uh, was in Atlanta and they put me on his line, ended up scoring a goal. And I guess the story keeps going from there, but uh, obviously special times for sure. So Alan, in that, in that moment, as an agent, I think you probably have a choice, right? So Larry Plo tells you, you got 48 hours. You could, you could, you could have called David and said, David, you're going to get 48 hours. You better get, get out there and bust your, bust your ass. Right. You could have said that. Why didn't you? I would never tell a player in advance that he's going to be cut from an NHL camp and this is when, that it's a done deal, it's in the cards. I think it's good for every player to come in to have a, a particular mindset. And, and I remember after David's first skate in St. Louis, I called you and we talked, you were in the hotel, and, and David said to me, I know I can play in this league. And I don't think in all of my career, I've ever had an 18 or 19 year old player say to me, you know, after the first day of camp, I know I can play here now. But David believed that. Why would I do anything to take that belief away from him? I figured, you know what? Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. David's mindset is unique. And if anybody is ever going to come in and knock people's socks off and, and make a team, it's David with that mentality. And you, you got to understand that I also went through that two years before when I went from house league to junior AAA, the exact same feeling. No one thought I was going to make the team. No one knew who I was. I, I went basically from my hometown of Sherbrooke because of all kinds of politics stuff. And I got invited to junior AAA and it was the same thing. Like no one knew who I was. I, I, may, I had to make an impression and make it really quickly. And I did. I ended up uh, rookie of the year in, in junior AAA. And then all over again the next year for when I basically, I remember I was working out uh, at my house and I got drafted in, uh, in Lewiston in the sixth round and someone one of our family friends called or, or showed up at the house. He's like, hey, you got drafted in the sixth round uh, by the Lewiston Maniacs. I had no idea. And I, I was, oh, uh, on. yeah. <laughs> and so again, I, n nothing fazed me when it came to that um, because I wasn't playing hockey to be drafted by L Lewiston. I know they had called during the year. Some teams wanted me to go right away and play a few games in junior. I was trying to keep my... Uh, my chance to maybe go in the NCAA. Uh, there was also a couple of universities that I'd call. So I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And over the summer, they drafted me. So now I show up. I had a good meeting with Clem Jordan. He was one of the best coaches I've ever had. Uh, he gave me the confidence to go for at least 48 hours and see how it felt to play against real players in, in major junior. Um, and I went and I had the, the first day I had there was the exact same feeling I had in my first day in, in St. Louis. I don't know what happened that day. I, it was, I don't know what was going on. I was scoring every single shot. Like it felt like I scored 10 shots in a row. I did that in junior. And then when I came my first day in training camp in St. Louis, the same thing happened. And that's probably what Alan refers to when I say, I, I feel like I can play in this level. Um, one more thing on that. Uh, Octagon always does a camp every August in Montreal. And during, before I, I went to the Hockey Canada thing, I went to play 
and Alan met me there. Marty Havlat was there, Mark andre Fleury, Milan Michalik, uh, and his brother. A couple of the guys that obviously are clients of, of Alan, and playing with those guys gave me the confidence. And they were stars. Like, Marty Havlat was one of the best players in, in the NHL at the time. Obviously, Flower was Flower and is still Flower to this day. <laughs> so it's great to see. But that gave me a lot of confidence as well heading into my first camp. And you know what? I, re I remember that. I remember that. Uh, after you scrimmaged with these guys, Marty and Milan came up to me and they're like, who's that guy? And I was like, oh, that's uh, David Perron. They're like, oh my God, he's got the sickest hands. And they were raving about him. <laughs> so I go up to David and he's standing with his mother after the skate. And I said, uh, you made quite an impression. I've had lots of, uh, Lots of you know younger players come in and scrimmage with all these NHL guys, and I've never heard them raving about a player the way they are you. There you go. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Humble as ever. I, I have to ask because because there's a couple things here that I uh, that that come to mind. The first thing is we've seen recently for anybody that that missed out on Keith Kachuk, we know what Brady and Matthew are like to play against. Keith Kachuk chasing you at 19 years old down the ice in St. Louis. Were you even slightly intimidated by that? That seems like a scary prospect. <laughs> oh, I was extremely scared. Uh, <laughs> I mean, those old guys too, back in the day, the, the veterans, they were basically running the team like as they were almost like coaches. So you could tell right away the moment you stepped in the room, Big Walt had a big presence, uh, was going to be a leader. And, and basically make a lot of decisions for a team uh, in many, many ways, really. So pretty scary, I'm not going to lie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I tried to stay out of his way for the next couple of days and, and see if I could survive. But, uh, yeah, that's uh, – and it's funny because this guy, uh, Walt, was probably and easily the toughest guy on me. Like, he was, he was very hard but also very fair. And he was the same guy that would invite me to Thanksgiving dinners at his house and play – hockey downstairs with Matthew and Brady when they were like nine, 10 years old. That's uh, cool. He did the same thing at Christmas. Um, so I, I can't, I could never really say he hated me. I don't think he hated me. He was just trying to straighten me out in the things that I, I needed to get better and which I did. I think I owe him a lot for that. Uh, and it was kind of the old school, tough love that maybe we don't get to do anymore, but it's how it was uh, back then. It's fine. Uh Alan, you mentioned something about David Perron's hands, and I want to set you up for this because um, uh, obviously Milan Mahalik and and uh, and everybody else at camp were not the only ones that noticed his hands. So Perron is at camp. He uh, and we're, remember, we're just at the forty-eight hour mark here, so we kind of have to discuss how the heck it extended because it did. You did. You know, David did stay with the team. So what's your next conversation with Larry Plo, and then what's your next conversation with David Perron? So, so Larry calls me at, at the 48 hour mark and he said, uh, Hey, Alan, uh, have you talked to David today? And I said, uh, no, not yet. He goes, Oh, he says, uh, something uh, pretty funny happened with, uh, Keith Kachuk today. And he told me the story and, and, and Larry and I are laughing. He's describing Keith Kachuk chasing David Perron all over the ice because he stole the puck from him and scored. <laughs> and uh, and Larry and I are rolling. He's like, I can't send the kid back to junior after doing something like that. He says, so we're going to keep him another day or two. And uh, and and, you know, the coaches are thinking about maybe playing him in one game and uh, we'll be in touch. Hmm. Uh, so David played in a game and I think you played in a preseason game and you scored. And uh, then yep. Larry, Larry called. And he said, uh, hey, Alan, um, yeah, David uh, looked really good out there. He scored a goal. And I think we're going to keep him for a couple of more days. And uh, a couple of more days go by, and, uh, and, and I don't hear anything from Larry. And, you know, no news is good news. And uh, I, I get a call from Larry, I think, three or four days later. And he said, uh, you know what, Alan, he's, he's doing real well. You know, I, I can't believe he's still here. But, uh, you know, coaches want to see him in another game. Hmm. And, uh, and, and David ended up playing another game. This kept going on all throughout the last week of September until I get a call from Larry around September 30th. And he says, uh, hey, Alan, uh, you, you know, we got to keep the best players here. David's made the team. Wow. 
<laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> so David, I, now we got to go to you on this because yeah, you know, it, you, let's let's rewind to your to like the fact is that you were not guaranteed even a preseason game. So do you remember sitting in the dressing room putting that jersey on for the first time? Uh, or is it all really, just a blur? No, it was probably a, a blur. And I also, right uh, two days before that first NHL game, they used to do those AHL games at like noon and then oh. one NHL game at 7 at night or maybe at 1 at 2 p.m., one at 7. And we went to Dallas. I played one game there um, again, uh, against the AHL team there, played pretty well. And I remember that that's kind of what helped me also get that first uh, exhibition game uh, being around the big boys was was pretty special. Uh, I also remember just kind of not knowing, seeing guys getting cut. And one one time there's a, there's an older guy, French guy that played in the AHL, had a really good career in the AHL, Charles Linglet. And he came to me, he's like, hey, you got a chance to make the team. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like there's, I don't know, 35 guys left. He's like, well... Just so you know, like here's how it goes. Normally, the junior players go for, go back first because they got to get playing. The HL camps are started, so they keep those guys around for a while. Now we're getting to that point where those guys are gone too, and there's basically like I don't know, like 30 players left. So he's like, if if you're still here, they're starting to look at you for real. Just so you know, so I was like, I wasn't sure if he was kidding or not. To be honest with you, I was like, all right, well that's cool. Thanks for telling me at least. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, sure enough, uh, I, I kind of ended up being in the hotel for for a long time. They they actually had never told me I made the team or not. They just kind of kept me around for the first part of the season. And uh, the same thing, the nine nine game trial was was still training camp for me. I, I kept going on. I never knew if I'd go back or not, and uh, I ended up staying. And and you know, I I think because you know we've all been through that 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 process. If you played hockey, you know what it's like to be cut. You know what it's like to like wait. And I've, I've always wondered what it is at the NHL level. Because, you know, for me growing up in Scarborough, it was there's a bulletin board and you go to the arena because, you know, this is pre-internet and you would like look at the list of names. Is, is it, a uh, you know, after that nine game tryout, do they finally say, okay, you're staying or is it just you're still there? You never get the call to go down and, you're go- and you say to yourself, I guess I'm here now. Yeah, they told me after uh, my ninth game, uh, I think it was nine or maybe eight. I think nine that I was going to stay the whole year. Uh, so, yeah, and then from that moment, I kind of started to look uh, for a place to, to stay. Cause I was at basically in the hotel from uh, all September, October, <laughs> I think maybe all November as well. Cause they spread my nine games uh, to, to keep me as long as possible and kind of <laughs> oh, make a geez. decision later on. No, but I, I get it. It's kind of smart on them. It's it's, it would have been good for me, even if I went back, cause I get more practice time at the NHL level, it wasn't like a negative. It was just the way it went. Uh, and I, I wasn't playing perfect by any means. Like I was probably making a lot more mistakes than I wanted, or they wanted me to make in certain games. They would put me sometimes in a more offensive role, sometimes more defensive role, or I actually less ice, ice time. See, I would react to that. Um, and uh, they made the decision later on. I also remember David, that uh, uh, we met together just after the nine game mark, uh, I think he may have played 10 or 11 games. And it was at uh, the Hilton Checkers, downtown LA. We met in the lobby and we're sitting there for a couple hours talking. And, and the one thing I noticed had been, you know, two months since you started camp with St. Louis, you were, you were big. You had put on uh, a lot of muscle and a lot of bulk I couldn't believe how quickly you had put it on and you were working closely with the blue strength coach every day, Nelson. And he was, you guys had a super close relationship with each other, but I think that had to also play a, a, a role in, they had a plan and the plan was, you know, David doesn't play every single game, but this is a development year. And if he plays 50, 55 games, and and puts on 10 15 pounds of muscle uh he's further uh along in his development career wise than he would be had he gone back had you gone back to junior and and i think yeah. ultimately that became the plan but i i'm convinced that that was not the plan in any way until the end of training camp 
Yeah, no, that's exactly what happened. And I also ended up living at Nelson's house, who was the only, only French uh, speaking person in the organization. That was part of the decision. Um, and speaking with Nelson, I'm, I'm pretty sure they gave him no choice. They just brought him in the room and say, hey, uh, do you mind bringing him to your house? He, he, was he, what was he going to say? No. Um, <laughs> and it, it, was, it was like having a four or five year old back at their house because I asked them so many questions about nutrition, uh, strength training, uh, recovery. I mean, you name it, all kinds of life questions. He was there for me. We're still uh, in, co like, in connection uh, to this day. He just retired from his uh, strength and conditioning, uh, I think, director in Columbus. And he moved down to the islands, like Caribbean islands somewhere. Oh. Uh, he always talked about this his whole life. He wasn't going to do it at some point. And I never knew if he was going to do it or not, but he did. He, sent, he always sends me pictures now. Um, and one of these days, I'll have to go down there and see him again. Oh, well, I, David, it seems, well, I mean, it's perfect that he spoke French. It also seems like it's perfect for a young player to get into those habits early, right? I mean, they talk about that yeah. all the time. It's, it's, you know, uh, there's a lot of people out there with skill, a lot of people out there with uh, just absolute out and out skill, but there it's the mindset and the mental toughness to not go home and, you know, eat a bag of cookies. And, you know, you guys, you really have to, it's, it's a real commitment. I, I want to know. Alan, from your perspective, and you'd, you've done this for 25 years plus, um, have you ever had a player, like you, you must have sat in the stands the first time you saw him play and probably in St. Louis and thought, I can't believe what's happening here. First time I saw David play was uh, with Lewiston in uh, the Quebec Major Junior League in his draft year. And, uh, and Lewiston went to the Memorial Cup uh, and played in the Mem Cup that year as well. So I saw David play probably four or five times uh, in what became his draft year and then went through the whole NHL draft experience with him. So I got to know him pretty well even before he, he went to his first NHL training camp. But at the same time, in my 26-plus years representing players, I have never seen a player ever go from house league to the NHL within four years of each other. And uh, it's, it's a remarkable story. It's a remarkable accomplishment. And, and I think it, it takes a certain level of, of confidence uh, and maturity to come into a camp at 19, an NHL camp, and go through that whole process and remember, David missed rookie camp. He missed the rookie tournament. He came in three days into the NHL camp and was one of the last 23 men standing. An incredible accomplishment. David, is there any truth to the rumor that you were giving guys skills lessons in your rookie year? <laughs> no, I was doing my own thing and they would <laughs> tag along and kind of call it that. Uh, I do remember Keith Kachuk. Uh, joining in on, on the stick handling uh, drills that I was doing, also having his kids uh, just sitting on the bench, uh, all practice with their gear, helmet on, everything. Um, and one, the, the moment the practice was over, the last whistle of practice, those, those two would step on the ice. Brady and Matthew would step on the ice, and we'd end up passing pucks around, doing stick handling drills. And, uh, I mean, I'm glad. I, I got this crazy picture I found this summer while uh, cleaning my house back home of me and him me, Brady, and Matthew going to Montreal on a private jet because Keith Kachuk is going to the All-Star game. I'm going to the rookie game. And those two right, rolled down to me, see you in the NHL, and they signed it. It's, it's a pretty cool picture because, they, sure enough, they are in the NHL. They're pretty confident kids, and they're, they're having a great impact on the league right now. And, and, and are they as intimidating as their father was? I, I don't see them like that. For, it, it's funny because to my teammates, they are. And uh, the first couple of times, Matthew had uh, a couple run-ins with other guys throughout the NHL. Then we'd play Calgary and they'd be like, wow, this gets crazy. <laughs> and for me, I don't see him like that. We, we, we get up to the face-off circle and he's like, hey, what's up, Perry? How are you? And they've always been so nice and respectful to me. But to everyone, I think Walt and Chantal, his wife, have raised some unbelievable kids some and and i'm i guess i feel like i'm part of that too they've always taken care of me as uh as a young guy and still to this day i'm happy to see them yeah 
Wow. I mean, it's funny how life comes full circle, isn't it? Oh, it's it's unbelievable. I can't believe that I'm able to play uh, against those those two after playing with their their dads basically three years, and I, I'm playing against them even longer. And I guess people ask all the time, my question, like, why why do you keep going? Why do you keep pushing to get better even at my age? Well, that's why those, all those experiences that I got early on, I, I feel like I I, I never want this to end, and I, I keep pushing as hard as I can. David, you and I are the same age, so don't say at my age. It makes me feel old, okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're still young. We're I still think young. so. I Great think so, set of I, hair and everything, too. That's perfect. That's right. That's right. It's, <laughs> it's, it, it's, if it's a hair piece, you don't need to know about it. Um, but uh, I, I do want to say this. You know, One of the things that we're trying to do with this show is, is show the other side of you know, because David, we get we get the player side. We usually get the general manager side, and you know, you hear the insiders talking. But what you never really get to hear as a fan, and that's what I am here, is you don't get to hear about the agent's effect on a player, the agent's effect on a general manager, the agent's effect on the game. So, if you could speak about Alan as though he's not here, what would you say yeah. about your relationship with Alan Walsh and the effect <laughs> he's had on your career? Well, unbelievable. I think the, the pulse that he had uh, to have for my first experience really in, in the NHL was incredible. He could have easily uh, maybe just took it and say, all right, sounds good. We'll send him to junior because uh, it didn't really matter, to be honest, if I went back or not. Maybe I'd still... But I always look back at this like there's always a first rounder coming the next year. There's always a set of new draft picks, trades new GM, new coaches, whatever. You never know what it takes me. Maybe I would have never played in the NHL either. So uh, I got to thank him a lot for that. And I, I think it's on every single decision that we've, we've had to make together. I think Alan's always had a great pulse and what's needed at, at the right time. Uh, did, did he have to call me? Did he have, not have to call me? And he's always obviously respected my decision on, on different things. So I think that's, that's what I think of, of you, Alan, is your pulse has been uh, pretty unbelievable on, on many decisions we had to make. And Alan, well, that's, uh, that's pretty humbling uh, coming from uh, David Perron. It is. And Alan, I was going to ask you the same question and you know, speak about David is always not here. What's, you know, you've, you've, you've dealt with, I, I, it's got to be hundreds of players. Um, your relationship with David is clearly special. What is it? How, how will you view this when one day you're, you, you retire and you walk away? What are you going to, what are you going to think and say about the David Perron era of your career? Well, the, the relationship with David is a lifelong relationship. It's not related just to uh, David's hockey career. You know, we've been together, working together closely for 16, going on 16 years right now. That's, that's almost half of, you're 33 now, that's almost half your life that uh, we've been together. And um, certain things stand out over the years, standing with your mom and dad in the stands, watching you lift that Stanley Cup uh, almost three years ago uh, was an incredible thing to see. And um, uh, watching you party after winning the cup was also an incredible thing to see. <laughs> it, it, was, it was pretty legendary. Uh, I don't think uh, many people thought that you had that in you, but it was uh, awesome. I didn't think I had that in me either. <laughs> are those stories that we can tell or are those ones that we just, we can't say on the show? Well, There's a well, couple of pictures it. floating out there on the internet uh, that uh, if you want to Google uh, David Perron Stanley cup celebration, I'm sure one or two of them will uh, pop up. Yeah. And, you know? and speaking of Paul's with Alan, he, he never called me on that either. <laughs> <laughs> he never told me to stop. <laughs> <laughs> Not a chance. In fact, in fact, uh, the Blues won the cup. You know, David won the cup uh, on the ice in Boston. And uh, we saw each other after the game for a little bit. But the team pretty much fast outed back to uh, St. Louis. So while I'm watching all this partying going on, the only thing I'm thinking of is, hey, I wish I were there with David to party. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> David, when you did finally win the cup with St. Louis, did, did Keith Kachuk reach out to you? He was on the ice. He's, he's been working for a team, and I, I saw him there the, when he lifted, uh, lift, lifted the cup himself, too. And I know um, in his career, he didn't end up winning the cup, but he's, he obviously uh, wants to, to keep helping a team do that. And 
And when he did, I was extremely excited for him as well. And I'm sure it might not be exactly the same feeling as, as when you play, but um, definitely we had some conversations. We're still in touch every once in a while. Obviously, we're texting each other. Um, so it's uh, obviously a pretty cool feeling to have him on the ice with me when, when we won. Yeah, no kidding. No kidding. It's pretty cool. Well, um, gents, it's, it's kind of cool to get it a little bit as, as, the, as the observer here. It's, it's cool to get a firsthand view of what your relationship is. And I know that there's like a million other stories that we could tell. And David, I hope that um, I hope that you'll come back on and tell them. Like, there's so much more that we'd I'd, we'd probably want to talk about the the first year in Vegas and how special that was and that cup run, um, and then of course the the cup run which you know ended in you lifting the Stanley Cup. Uh, but for now, the the story of how you got into the league, which uh, honestly is just spectacular. Um, I just want to say thank you for your time today. Thank you for helping usher in. Alan Walsh's brand new podcast. Yeah, no uh, problem. And I hope that you're going to be a faithful listener because we're going to need somebody to watch this thing. I think it'll be incredible. I think it'll be a great hit and I'm definitely going to be listening for sure every week. David Perron, Alan Walsh, Agent Provocateur. That's episode one on the books. And uh, we'll be back next week with another one.